Park session. This session is being recorded. I'm sorry. Um, recorded. The presenters will let you know whether you will be able to address your questions at any time during the presentation or after the presentation has finished. This presentation will be delivered in English. Simultaneous translation is available in channel 3. Additional headphones are available in the excavator area at the rotunda. We will appreciate that you change your mobile phone to vibration or silent mode in order to have your full attention to this session. Finally, we'll, we will distribute the evaluation form. Please make sure to complete it before the session is over and hand it before you leave this room. Now we are ready to start. The presenter of this session are Melissa Barral and Amber Lassiter. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Can you do me a favor? Can you hit the light? The first one. The first one. The first one. Yeah. All right. So it's kind of weird because well, we only have a couple of people. But do you count as an audience? Yes, you do. For this one, you do. Yeah. <laughs> well, what we decided to do was we actually we brought we brought forward a, a teaching thing that we do because nothing says retention better for students than engagement and actually catching them in the classroom when they're doing their thing. So I actually teach uh, the sciences uh, at Berkeley College, and it's typically a minority-based, minority-serving institution. And so for students to come in and learn sciences or learn things that are normally not of first nature to them, it's really difficult to capture their attention and keep them involved and motivated. And I'm sure you, your masters, you're gonna find that it's, that's gonna be the difficult task. Getting students to connect the information you're getting, you're giving them and getting them to kind of memorize it, but learn it and, and produce critical analysis of the information that they're learning. So we came up with this conquering test anxiety theory to sort of kind of signify that when people are taking exams, I mean, admit it, when you're taking an exam, you're nervous sometimes, right? Sometimes, yes. What makes you nervous? Um, habit. Okay, yeah, <laughs> just, uh, right? If, if your fear of high stakes, if it's a high stakes exam. Right, what makes you nervous when you're taking an exam? Um, She's nervous now. Yeah. When you take an exam, <laughs> what makes this you nervous? Yeah, like you're sitting down, you're about to take an exam. Everybody gets nervous. It's normal. What time. makes you nervous? The time. Some people focus on the time. Some people, it depends on whether, you know what? I probably should have studied a little better for the exam. I'm not prepared. I know I'm probably gonna do really bad or I don't know the material. I haven't grasped the concept correctly. Anything can be a trigger for nerves. And so the idea behind this is that this is your brain. This is your brain on drugs, okay? This is your brain. And your brain has different sections in it, and different sections respond differently to stress and this nerve autonomic response of, I'm about to take an exam, I'm freaking out. So, you know, your thalamus, it um, actually grants a switchboard that turns on the sweating, and you get more saliva, and you start to sweat, and it's just a natural response. We just learn how to kind of control it. It's like sort of the first time that you went up in front of the class to get a public presentation. Do you remember that? To some people, it comes naturally, right? They can just get up and talk about anything, right? But to some people, it's a struggle. They have to learn. They have to kind of participate in a different way. Um, your hippocampus is your sensory cortex. And interestingly enough, your frontal and your temporal lobe are actually uh, needed in the problem solving and the critical thinking area. So that makes sense why if somebody gets nervous and this area gets triggered or something's wrong with this area, you're not going to retain the information that you studied, especially if you're nervous. That would make sense, right? So we kind of got this, this idea. I originally started this idea because I was like, well, what makes me nervous during an exam? What makes me nervous? I take good notes. I take very good notes, me personally. But some of my students don't know how to do this. Um, and they need help. So we taught them to use you know, color tabs as reminders and colors and shapes. And, and take the information as puzzle pieces and put it in a larger scale as how that piece fits to me and how that information can apply to me. You're more likely to remember something or learn something if it has direct applicability to you as an individual. OK? 
Can we all agree on that a little bit? Yes. Somebody's telling you something you don't care about, you don't want to hear it. You're just like, whatever. Right? So the thing about it is what will drive the student's interest and what will keep the students motivated? And the thing is that what we've done is, well, what I do in the classroom is I use a lot of multimedia mechanisms to kind of get students motivated and thinking outside this provo you know, proverbial box of, you know, you read it on the text, chapter two, and here it is on the exam, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And sort of get them thinking in a way that's more like this, because this is really how we process information. That it, it's not a series of a direct line, it's more of a, an umbrella of things that help you recall information. And that umbrella can, you know, range from anywhere from order to symbols or numbers that you kind of, you know, look for in your brain or a color or maybe of some kind of a movement or a song or a rhythm reminds you of information. Sometimes if you exaggerate something, you think big or large or sound can make you, re, you know, kind of recapture that information. And your senses, <clears throat> that your memory behaves in a way that's, kind of like an interweb of different connections. And so your neurons behave that way too. So it would make sense that if you want somebody to learn something, you would encompass a little bit of everything. Or you would teach somebody how to specifically target their, their particular memory based on their learning style. So we kind of covered it in the last panel when we talked about learning styles because we know that there are different learning styles and that depending on the modality that you use best or you see best fit to learning, that's gonna be the one that you're gonna stick with and that's gonna be what you're gonna use as your principal motivator for memorizing and retaining information. So as I gave this demo in other places, but I'm not gonna do it here because I only have two people, so I'm not gonna do it here. What I do is I, I show everybody a teaching demo of, of actual an actual page out of the textbook that I teach, right? And it's meant to scare the crap out of everybody in the audience because if you like neurons, you're like, okay, cool, yeah, I get it, don't we? Awesome. If you don't, you're gonna wanna hear what I say because what I tell the, the audience is, okay, I'm gonna give you a lecture. What I want you to do is, I want you to take a pencil and write what you can. Either write what you remember from what I'm saying to you or write what you see. Most people will go and draw the picture. They'll draw the picture and they'll be like, all right, as, as I'm talking. So I'll go in full blast professor mode and I'll be like, okay, so this is what a neuron does. You know, neurons sit next to each other. They carry this information. Syntax is called the neurotransmitters. And those neurotransmitters give information to the next neuron and so forth and so forth. And so it's like we're at a lake and we throw a rock in and we skip the rock in the water. What happens when the rock falls in the water? What happens? What do you create in the water? A ripple. A ripple. And neurons work the same way. That if you're affecting one neuron, you're not just affecting that one, you're affecting many things around it. So it's a big effect. And so this is what happens when people are uh, presented with dopamine, in specific uh, to cocaine. So when they take cocaine, what <coughs> happens is these kind of dopamine transporters are actually blocked and dopamine doesn't behave the same. And so now you have this excitatory neurotransmitter flooding the synapse and causing that high, if you will, in a person. And so giving that explanation, I actually give them two or three minutes to kind of jot down what I'm saying. And there's a purpose to it, which I'm not gonna give you. So that's what I do here. And it would have been the group time, but I'm, not, I'm gonna be real, there's not enough people to keep on. This is going to be a really quick one. Go. And so what ends up happening is after she gives that lecture, you use your, your notes, and we present you with a question. And just so that you can see your arguments. So here <coughs> So the takeaway from this usually is, as she's lecturing, I'm watching the room, and you begin to see the students get that lost look. Like, hmm, what is she talking about? You already lost the population. And I call that the Charlie Brown syndrome. Sometimes when you're sitting in class and your professor is lecturing to you, you zone out. When you come back, all you hear is wah, 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 right? And we're realizing that that's what's happening to many of our students in the classroom. 
And so we want them to be able to become active learners. And we know through the cone of learning, there's just certain things that has to happen in order for them to be able to retain this information. So we know you're only gonna remember 10% of the things that you read, 20% of the things that you hear. I'm not gonna name it all, but the big takeaway is this. You can remember 90% of what you say and what you do. So our goal in terms of motivating you is to help you find out what your learning style is. Believe it or not, most of our college students do not know how they learn and how they actually process this information. And so we begin to give them this exposure, all the, all the different learning styles. We make them aware that you can have more than one learning modality. Personally, I'm a kinesthetic learner, as you can probably No, 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 stay back, stay back. But now we have time to go through the learning oh, I'm so used to it. We're just used to Zooming, because it's like the other time is of the essence. So I am a kinesthetic learner, but where is it? It's been physical. I operate better that way. And it's really great and awesome, because the research tells us that whatever your learning style is as the educator, that's the way you teach according to that learning style. So when I went into the public sector, K-12, for 10 years plus, what I had to do was actually take time out to learn what type of learning styles were in my classroom. So thank God my students were kinesthetic and visual like me. So that meant that the information that I was disseminating to them, they were able to process. But guess what? Every now and then, there was a couple curveballs in the room. I had some auditory learners that were in there too. So I also had to strategically plan, as we talked about in the last session, about differentiating instruction. I had to plan for those type of learning environments for them, so that way I could disseminate that information to them, and that they, they could learn from each other as well. So that was a key takeaway. So what I'm realizing is, is that our students, especially our first generational students, are coming into the college classroom for the first time, and they don't know how they learn this information. They don't realize that they need to be an active participant in the learning process. Why? Yes. Okay. Because prior to coming to college, what we learned is that the professor or the teacher is there to just give you this information, and then I'm supposed to be this passive learner in the learning environment and just take it all in. So when you're presented with this high order thinking task, how do we get Because so we have to get you through that process. So what my department does is the Department of Academic Support Center. I have the privilege of overseeing two of the ten campuses, traveling back and forth. And I work with Dr. Baral, and at that workshop, what we do is we teach the students about the different learning styles, and we help them to identify what their learning style is. At the end of that workshop, I give them a sweet tip. And the reason why it's called a sweet tip, I'll get shown to you. How about three? <laughs> we usually bring like a whole package full of that we had actually to here. But on there, the reason why it's called a sweet tip is because on a weekly basis, and one of the ways to help students to increase their retention and their study skills is that we give a strategy of the week. So whenever I give this workshop, which is known as the Learning Styles Workshop, we just offer them some study skills. So once they're able to identify what their learning style is, so that's fine. These are some strategies that they can go back and then implement. And the reason why it's called sweet is it's because it's a piece of sweet that's attached to that right? Because generally, students are not so prone to mistake paper as being handed out to them. So then one of the challenges that I give to the students after they identify what their learning style is, one, take a look at the list, and usually there's more that's off. Take a look at the list, and just see from that list, which ones are you currently using? Ask them. And talk about the successes and the strategies of it. Do you know your learning style? Uh, I think I do. I think I'm a lot like you, but I'm a combination visual, kinesthetic, but also solitary. Mm -hmm. mm. Not so much social. Yeah.
another one that actually goes with visual and also it's power presentations. Mm -hmm. So when I have to really learn a process or a, a new way to pitch uh, a product or you know any power presentation, anything that you do even in school is about pitching what you do, right? Mm -hmm. And the work that you have done. And something that I use is, uh, well, it's no more than 10 uh, slides. Also, don't write everything down and use a lot of graphics. So something that I did for, for my company was to uh, develop this uh, deck of cards, like the regular deck of cards with the clubs and everything, and I did develop a method of why each one would go where, and I would put on an icon that would represent what I want to say when I use that card or when I see that card. So the same thing is with the power of presentation, I want to be able to look at the slide and say, I know what I got to say now, and then I, and then I do it. So I write a script, I complement it with uh, with something visual, with an icon, and then um, I have to say it aloud so that, and I practice it with different people, and that's how I manage to get presentations or do any panels or anything like that. And that's one of the things that you said that is so crucial that our students don't remember, is that you do need that scrappy moment. You have to give your brain that time to process that information. <coughs> I gave them the same illustration of the way your brain processes information is the same way we digest the food. It needs and so far too often our students come in and they're like, I read the chapter. What was the chapter about? And so that's where these strategies actually come into play. I should just share. So I'm glad you are here, 30 style. <laughs> we used the, the, the bark um, survey to help the students identify their learning style. And then a lot of times I like to build that relationship with them and I'll guess what their learning style is. So I'll ask them, what is your major? What is something you enjoy doing? We go through that. I also have them stand up so that your professors, so the professors bring them to the workshop, so that the professors become aware of the different learning modalities that are in the room. And it was an eye opener. I need to share with you what one of her colleagues brought his class in for the workshop. And I think it was like a class of 30 students. And out of the 30 students, there were only two in the class that were reading and writing learners. And he's like, no wonder nobody's reading the text. No wonder nobody's responding to the discussion boards. And it was an eye opener to him. He's like, you know what? Maybe it's time for me to figure out what I'm doing, at least to see as a way of understanding and, and checking for learning in that particular domain. So it is crucial. It's vital. It's very, very, very important. So once they have identified what their learning style is, we offer them some strategies. We let them um, talk about what strategies they may be currently using. We talk about the effectiveness of it possibly how they can tweak it. Because the main takeaway is not to just give you information overload. We want you walking out feeling the power of this effective tool. And I always, because I am usable too, always encourage the students I have a karaoke machine. So I tell them that they can come to the Academic Support Center and I have two microphones and one of them is always mine. And we get to sing through their notes as well. But that's the purpose of this workshop. In my department, I you can get this workshop at any of the 10 campuses and it is offered quarterly. And the purpose behind it, obviously, is to help you to become this autonomous learner. We're going to talk a little bit more about the format of how we actually take this learning styles workshop of you learning what type of learner you are and those strategies and how it's implemented in the environment when you're in the test mode. But some of the key takeaways from that is, is what we're going to be focusing on now is what's known as our cheat sheet. So we, I basically, I, I did this once in college, but I never, I never got anything out of it. And then I realized that if, if you give students this kind of pseudo expectation that you're allowing them to cheat, they don't. I, I know that sounds crazy. Does that sound crazy? A little bit. It's sort of like if you tell somebody, don't use your phone. First, they're going to use their phone. But if you tell them, just take out your phone. It's totally cool. Just look, people kind of tend to not look at it. It's, just, it's like the elephant in the room. It's this weird modality. So we identify, what I do is, it's time for my test, and this is for my midterm exam. And what I do is, we, I give them a review sheet, and they use the tool, the e-text, that's already embedded into the class, and they use it as a learning resource. And then we want them to use their metacognitive skills to make visual and word associations. And I tell them, this is what I'm gonna quiz you on, chapters one through four, and this is the information. And I want you to go and study, and I want you to go into the academic support center, I want you to form your groups, and I want you to work on your cheat sheet, which is your personalized sheet that you're allowed to bring the day of the exam. Trust me, it sounds crazy.
crazy but every